Bismillah. Is that good? Okay. Alhamdulillah. So, you know, in addition to the staff, the shepherd also holds another tool, which is called a rod or a club. So, again, you have to think of yourself in these terms. I have to make sure I have reach control safety down. Now, what can I do? The rod, the rod is there to literally ward off, uh, you know, any predators or anything that's dangerous. So, please, if you see things that are clear and present risks for your children, you have to speak out. You can't just be passive and go, uh, I'm not sure if I should say anything, if I should do anything. You have to be of that mindset that I need to shut it down because, you know, if I give um, this any more time, it might turn into something worse. And I shared last time, for example, you know, there was a, a mother that I had met who, whose daughter, who was a middle school aged uh, girl, and she was, uh, she had made some friends who basically started making her doubt her own sexuality as a 12 year old girl or 11, you know, middle school. And um, and I had the mother asked me what I should what she should do, and my advice was very clear. I was like, you need to remove her, these people from her life. There's no you know question in my mind that as long as they remain in her life, she will continue to have problems because you know if you have friends like that, God forbid, who are putting all these thoughts in your mind that you they're not they, she didn't you know come up with them. They're you know planting these seeds. Like well, how do you know? that you really are straight unless you experiment astaghfirullah with someone else that's the only way you can definitively know these are the types of thoughts that this poor girl was exposed to which obviously caused her a lot of confusion now imagine if the mother just maintained those friendships or allowed her to continue to you know hang out with those people you don't think that it's going to spiral into even worse things you know more experimentation with drugs alcohol god knows what else so you as the parents have to know how to immediately shut things down that you know are dangerous for your for your children. Yes. Excuse me. Mm -hmm. How do you go about shutting it down without the fear of Right. Right. So I mean I think every, you know, in this situation it was the schooling environment that her daughter was in. So that, I mean, that's a logistical issue that, you know, if you really as as parents sit there and think like, you know what, if the environment is like this and there's a, this is common practice, maybe we need to consider just pulling her out of that school, right? So it's kind of an easy fix. Every situation is going to require that sort of, you know, you know, tailored response. So it's hard to kind of give across the blanket because if it's family, it's obviously going to be closer and it's going to cause more problems. Or if it's someone in the community. So you have to really, uh, you know, um, be thoughtful about how you approach these things and maybe seek counsel. But I think having this sort of, uh, you know, I don't know if I should do anything because of a fear of a consequence, I think is far more dangerous because the consequences should be very clear. Like allowing your children to continue to be exposed to these types of threats is far worse than any fallout from actually, you know, stopping it. And and it's because their soul is at stake, right? I mean, people stuff all nowadays, you know, like I said, this this is such a common thing now. It's these are topics that are very, you know, talk, talked about loosely uh, in you know amongst our children. And so if you allow them to, to be exposed to this more and more, that's exactly what Shaitan wants. He wants to normalize all of these things, make it not a big deal. Um, and astaghfirullah, it just starts to chip away at their, their heart, their, their faith. And so that's why it's sort of like, no, I have to shut it down. Because the more they're in that environment, the more, you know, there's risk for them losing their soul, literally, from, a, from an Islamic perspective, right? So I would say, again, it's going to require a different response per situation, but just to be, um, be as, as uh, thoughtful as, process, uh, I mean, as possible. So um, then we talked about, bismillah, you know, so uh, once you see yourself again, that parenting isn't just this dream that I live, you know, that I dream up and that I, I imagine and it's all going to go exactly like the script that I want because I am who I am and my wife is who she is or my husband is who he is. Um, and we have the dua of all these amazing people. Those are all great, but the responsibility is still on every single one of us. And when we see that, then we look at, well, okay, now that I see myself as this leader and I have to protect the people that are under my care, how do I do that? You need to know your responsibilities first and then your rights. So you need to know what are the rights 
of children over the parents because that informs you what your responsibilities are, right? If you know what the children's rights are, then you know what you have to do as a parent. Then what are the rights of the parent over the child? Unfortunately, the script is totally opposite now. All parents go into parenting knowing very well what their rights are over their children, and it's, that's all they repeat to them. You know, you have to obey me, you have to listen to me, Jenna's under my foot, and we're just like constantly using, you know, scripture to uh, tell children to put them in their place and let them know clearly that we have all these huff over them. But we need to also be very informed beforehand what our rights are over them. And then also we talked about, you know, does culture define your parenting model? Or does Islam? Because if you come from a specific cultural understanding of parenting and there's a conflict there with uh, Islam, you have a decision to make. What's it going to be, right? Uh, and we talked specifically about double standards and the danger of double standards. Because in many cultures, this is um, common, right? That there's double standards for the way boys are treated versus the way girls are treated. And people don't realize that these are not fair. And when you have things that are imbalanced and unfair, they have consequences to that. So if you, you know, prefer your, your, your sons and you're always letting them get away with everything and you're um, treating them like they basically do no wrong and then you're hypercritical over your daughters and her every move is analyzed, you're going to create real problems for them in their adult life. Your boy will grow up to be a man who's very entitled and he wants you know, he's, he has a lot of expectations from his wife, and it's going to cause problems for him in that regard. Um, and also your daughter might, you know, grow up very resentful because she was suppressed all during her childhood. She wasn't allowed to do anything. You know, there were curfews imposed on her. There was always rules. She had to do more chores in the house. She was always, like, treated a different way than her son. Then you don't think that's going to cause resentment, right? it will absolutely cause resentment. And this is where, you know, she might also, you know, it, it just breaks things, the relationship down between parent and child. But if you abandon cultural, you know, standards and say, what is the standard of Islam? Then you see that it's just all the way across. Boys and girls are treated equally as children. They have the same, uh, you know, obligations to their parents. They should participate in the household the same. And men shouldn't, you know, or a, a boy should not be prevented from doing domestic work. This is not girls' work. To wash plates and do fold laundry doesn't make your uh, boy uh, feminine. These are attitudes, unfortunately, that are very, very, uh, you know, just damaging and, and wrong because it's completely against the sunnah of the Prophet The Prophet washed his own dishes. He, he, saw, he you know, uh, he was known to patch up his own clothing. So, astaghfirullah, whose, whose standards are we accepting? The, the greater society around us who really, you know, um, sort of, you know, poses boys and girls against each other and makes everything that's, uh, that girls do low and just, you know, like, we don't want to, you know, participate in those things. And so, if boys are taught that, then they learn to disrespect women's work and they learn to see themselves above, above and better. But if it's like, no. This is the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu and we all practice it across the board. Then it, again, brings that balance. And so, inshallah, you raise men and women who have respect for each other and who aren't being pitted against each other like the society wants, right? So always maintaining that balance. And we talked about um, the importance of, you know, being, you know, true to whatever you want your children to do. Model it first. You can't expect that your children are going to raise, uh, you know, grow up to be these model citizens and perfect you know, um, in every which way, if you don't model that behavior for them. So it's very important to be, you know, to, if you want your children to be properly guided, to, to know that they learn by imitating, listening to you, watching you, observing you. And so you need to check yourself and all the things that you want for yourself, make sure that you're doing them as well. And we also talked about tailored parenting and making sure that we know that no two children, even if they're in the same household, even twins uh, are the same. And you have to know uh, how to, again, when we talk about reach, control, and security, it's going to be different in some ways per child, even in the same household. Communication styles 
for boys and girls, for example, are going to be different. And you have to do that research and do the reading to know how to uh, talk about certain topics with each child differently, right? But also, which we're going to get to, inshallah, knowing your children's temperament, knowing that, you know, how, um, how are children different, uh, you know, in what ways, and, and knowing and understanding how their personality types um, present themselves. Uh, differently, but knowing again how to reach different personality types, which we'll get to inshallah. And so then we talked about you know the five characteristics of an effective leader are strong communication, passion and commitment, positivity, being positive, not being this negative person, and then you know authoritative model of parenting where you're just barking rules and orders constantly, and you're always in a negative state. It's going to be very difficult for you to get the respect of your children if you're like that. They may fear you and you may get them to do what you want in the moment, but you won't have their respect. And, the, and if you do it with young children, for, just wait and see what happens to you when they get into their teenage years. If that's your model of parenting, where you're just angry and negative and yelling and it's just like, just constantly like that, don't expect anything but the same to be shown to you when they hit those teenage years and they're slamming doors in your face and they're just not responding to you anymore, right? Because you've, they, they're they modeling what you've shown them, right? That I'm just going to be negative and angry and I'm shutting you out. And what I, you know, the conversations get shut down. It's going to all repeat itself. So positivity is really important to when you're parenting to really watch yourself and make sure your energy isn't down and negative all the time. Innovation to be creative. So a big responsibility, you know, and we talked about this too, is we have to be willing to, you know, read and, and get creative in terms of, you know, all the things that we want from our children, whether they're really young and we want to teach them different things. But we have to do that. I think our problem is, and it's just the, you know, circumstance that many of us live. We're living in difficult times. It's especially Bay Area life. A lot of us work uh, full time. So it's almost like we're in this constant, you know, rush or race and, and it, we don't have the time to do certain things. But if you can, um, you know, if you're, if you're always outsourcing everything that when it comes to your children to other people and you're not taking certain things on your own, it's going to cause a problem. You won't have much because you're, you're breaking down that relationship. They need you more than anybody else. So there's times, yes, where you, need, you can rely on other people to whether it's dropping them off um, you know, into child care or schools or Sunday school. But if you're not doing anything of your own that's unique for you and your child, then this is, you know, going to call. It's going to break down your relationship. So you got to have to start thinking innovatively about how can I make time for my children? How can I do certain things that are just me and them? And I'm not always, you know, just rushing from one event to the other or one thing to the other. And they're kind of, you know, we're like ships passing, you know, during the day or the night. And that's what families a lot of times happens. It's like we're all over scheduled. We have too many things going on. But where is the innovation? Is where it's like, no, I have to do something. So I have friends, for example who make it a point where, you know, once a year, for example, they will, um, you know, take a trip maybe, like a, a weekend trip or a day trip with, uh, with each child, just separating, you know, the, the children. So it's not, it's, it's to show that child that I see you, you matter to me, and our bond is really important. So just you and me, we're going to go, you know, for a day trip somewhere, and we're going to do whatever you want to do, and I'm going to bring you into my world or I'm going to go into your world. This is innovation. It's really thinking outside the box instead of, you know, always, um, like I said, uh, just, you know, the default setting, which is just to do, uh, you know, the same routine every single weekend or every single week. Think creatively about how to reach our, your children, inshallah. And then collaboration. This is, again, um, you know, knowing where, if you, if you do need help with certain things, knowing who your collaborators are, and working with people, whether they're educators, whether they're other, um, you know, maybe mental health, uh, people in the mental health field, people who know about children that you want to learn from, um, read from. There's people like Leonard Sachs. He's amazing. And he's come to the Bay Area several times. Uh, if Next time, if he comes, I highly encourage you to attend his talks because he, even though he's not Muslim, he's, you know, still a moral, ethical person. He sees the dangers that are happening in the society at large, and he's really trying to get parents back on track to take control again because we've we've lost control, right? So he's someone who we should definitely look to his books. He's written amazing books. Look to his material. But there's people like that that we should know about, like who you know whether they're you know again authors or educators or therapists. 
outside in the, you know, or, or here in, in our communities, but make sure that we know who to rely on. So um, again, those are the five characteristics of an effective leader. And then reminding ourselves constantly that parenting is a trust from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We will absolutely be asked about every single thing that we do. And when you weigh that constantly on your heart, then you don't look at your children as being little, you know, sort of servants that are just there to make your life easy. But you look at them like, I have to do everything in my power to, uh, to love them, to guide them, to, to give them uh, the foundations that they need to take on this very, very dangerous world. And so it's all on us. It's, and, and it's a, it should weigh us down. It shouldn't be something that we just use to kind of justify exploiting our children, which unfortunately a lot of parents, you know, it's like, I made them, I brought them into this world, I can do whatever I want with them. And we said, no, this is, that's, you have to reject that thinking 100%. They belong to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he gave it, them to us for an appointed time. We don't know how long, but if we accept that this is a huge weight on our shoulders, then we'll take this as seriously, right? It's not, we're not passively parenting. We're going to be actively parenting every day, okay? And then, um, you know, ch that children's rights are mandated by God. So knowing what those are, um, the Prophet said, um, sorry, hold on. Fear Allah and treat your children small or grown fairly with equal justice. So this, again, brings back, you know, what we talked about earlier is just making sure that you're really fair with your children and equal with them, not preferential treatment. Just because one child maybe really is sweet and very obedient and they always do what you say doesn't mean that they get more rights and more sort of, you know, you give them, you know, uh, more privileges uh, just because, you know, you like them better. And it's true that you will have uh, that. It's just a reality of life that some children you will feel stronger bond with than your other children if you have multiple children. But you have to be fair and, uh, and just when you're parenting. If you're using you know, um, them again uh, in this way where it's like, oh, because you, you know, I like you better or you do more things for me, therefore you get this and this, you're setting a really dangerous precedent and you have to be a, for yourself. You, know, you have to really be careful because Allah subhanahu wa will take you to account for that. Equal justice all the way across and, and be fair. Um, so the the and these are from this is from the Quran so the Baqarah the Prophet is, or excuse me Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that the father will bear the costs of their food and clothing on equitable terms. So this is just a reminder for the brothers that you know providing for your children um, is uh, is on you. This is you know one of their rights over you. And then um, another uh, hadith, the Prophet said, one of the rights of children over their parents is being given a nice name and having a good education. Uh, you will be called out with your names and your father's names on the Day of Judgment, so give nice names to your children. So just making sure that their education, who they're learning everything from, is, again, in line with your belief, with, your, with what you want for them. And that is what active parenting is, making sure you're you know, if you have young children and they're in first grade kindergarten, knowing what their teacher is going to be exposing them to. I think it was, um, I think it was Fremont, right? Recently they had a vote where they were going to start introducing, you know, um, was it, uh, there was, a, it was something about marriage, I can't remember, but they had a huge vote that they had to take with the school board because they were trying to introduce, you know, certain concepts to children at a very, very young age about different types of families, right? And so, alhamdulillah, you know, people showed up and they were able to shut it down. But some parents, the, the sisters that I knew who were involved, were very disappointed that more Muslims didn't show up. As we know, there's a very large population of Muslims in the Fremont School District. But they weren't probably even aware that this was being proposed. So this is the kind of stuff that we have to, as parents, again, be ahead of. No, what, is our, what are our, our kids being exposed to? That's a right. It's one of the rights of your children, that their education is solid. So making sure that, they, you know, you, you know that. Um, so yeah, we talked about this, but again, these this is uh, another reminder that there's no you know no two children are the same, and uh, these are two beautiful quotes from Ali ibn Abi Talib, radiallahu anhu, who said, "Do not raise your children the way your parents raised you; they were born for a different time." Okay, this is very important because a lot of our parenting is modeled after the way we were parented, but this is again a form of 
passive parenting because you're just repeating things that were done to you, even things that you didn't maybe even like as a child. You think, ah, it worked for me because I turned out okay, and I'll just repeat it to my kids. But we're living in very different times. And so being more active as a parent, you're looking at the world around, realizing children are totally different now than they were 10, 15, 20 years ago, and basing your parenting on what needs to be done now. And then, you know, this is another hadith that a lot of our understanding about how to reach children and how to teach them, you know, from different stages is is uh, is rooted from from this quote of uh, Ali uh, ibn Abi Talib again, radiallahu anhu. He said, "Play with your children till the age of seven, discipline and teach them from the age of seven to fourteen, and befriend them at the age of fourteen. So, and then you know, we went into the different um, stages and what we should, what our mindset should be. So, in that early stage between two and seven, play. Everything should be play-based. We should really be reaching our children with um, with just, you know, their imagination. They're in a world of imagination, and we need to reach them there. So storytelling with animation, song, rhymes, and obviously modeling good behavior. These are ways that we can teach them, right, about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, giving those, you know, uh, or creating a connection with Allah and the Prophet said, we have to be willing to meet them where they're at and they're in that imaginative state. So actually getting really well versed in how to teach children in that younger age, these are the things that you'll learn. Storytelling is huge. But not just you know reading a book, because we're all very good at reading books. We can read and we're great at that. I'm talking about animated storytelling, where you actually bring a story to life and really um, bring them into that age of wonder. Right, children. Why do we? They love cartoons and Pixar movies. It's because they tap into this, you know, love of wonder and magic and this world that's just beyond their, you know, imagination. And so, when we create that in our storytelling and connect it to Allah and the Prophet you're having the same effect. So, when you tell stories from the Sira that are miraculous, bring it to life. Right? Don't just say, oh, you know, Isra Miraj, the Prophet jumped on a horse and it had wings and it went, you know, like make it so dry and boring. Bring it to life, you know, bring that, um, just that, 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 like that vision, uh, that those visual effects into their mind so that they can actually imagine it. And if you can draw, even better. You know, if you can actually draw things while you're telling, that's amazing talent. Why not use it? But using that. And then songs and rhymes, being you know willing to just sing things to them, getting them like mashallah, you know, for the molid that was here last night, bringing them to places like that is really beneficial for their hearts. Children love songs, they love movement, they love all of those things. So exposing them to that is really important. Um, Ta'lif, which is not too far from here, especially on a Sunday, it's about 20 minutes. I do that drive from Pleasanton in this area. They have weekly molids, and it's a beautiful, if you've never been there, you should definitely attend, because there's children everywhere, and they are all, you know, they're mashallah to praise the Prophet but they, you know, they love it, and exposing your children to that is great. So those are things that we can do from a very early age to attach their hearts to the love uh, of the Prophet and obviously love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, of course, modeling. That's for the younger age. For that middle, the school-age children from between 7 and 14, we're, we should be in the mode of teaching, okay? Because now they can actually take instruction. Before seven, they're just in play mode, but at seven and beyond, they actually can, you know, think on a different level and actually, you know, you can reach them by teaching them and really breaking things down for them. So storytelling still works. Um, metaphors, analogies, really kind of tapping into their more logical brain where they're, where, you know, thinking things on an abstract level and they're able to think things differently than when they're children. You know, just kind of, you know, again, looking at see it or Quran, whatever it is that you want to teach them, but doing it, having that understanding that now they're open to these types of things, right? And then uh, still, modeling is very important that we continue to model uh, really good behavior. So uh, also in this age, um, you know, teaching them concepts like fiqh, you know, and really bringing down, breaking down the why of what we do, right? Um, because in the beginning, it's just we're just teaching them what what it is. They, they they may know Quran, but they have no idea of the meanings. They might not know all of the different beliefs, you know, because they're too young to sort of get certain concepts. But once they're a little older, you start breaking things down. Breaking, you know, this is why we do certain things. So fiqh, and then also I I, I encourage um, sharing stories that display things that 
appeal to this age, right? Uh, stories that uh, talk about valor, nobility, courage, honesty, bravery. A lot of kids in this age, because they're dealing with their own insecurities, they might uh, see bullying going, you know, uh, around them. They might know, have friends that are sort of, you know, being mistreated a certain way. It appeals to them to have stories that talk about, you know, um, about valor, about winning, you know, instead of always seeing things that are kind of in that negative light around them. So you want to expose them to that, you know, inshallah. And then um, I also think it's really important at this uh, stage to teach them practical rules and tips and life skills that boost their confidence. So I was actually telling my husband, you know, that I, I think middle school children should totally, parents should really look into putting them into classes for to boost their confidence that, uh, you know, we teach them public speaking skills. And so we were just having this conversation, and then he attended, actually, um, there's a, have you heard of uh, Toastmasters before? How many have heard of Toastmasters, right? So a lot of professionals use this, and people who, you know, are trying to obviously get their public speaking skills set. But he said he went to one, and there was a, a man there who brought his young, like, 12 or 11-year-old kid. And I was like, yes, that's a really smart parent, because he, he's realizing, if I give my, you know, middle schooler who's full of insecurity an opportunity to actually work and hone in on that skill set, it will boost their confidence in ways that you can't imagine as they grow into the high school age and you know college and on, and on in their professional careers. Just to be able to be comfortable speaking in front of people and you know having their voice and knowing how to do that effectively. Why not start early? So these types of life skill sets are really important, or just anything that you you know uh, a skill set. You know if they're in a sport or, or something else that they can learn that kind of, again, is special, it's their own thing, um, you know, nurture that. If they have an interest in something like that, nurture that because it does help boost their confidence in an age where their, you know, shaitan is just really tries to break their confidence down. And I know because I work a lot with teens, and this is, we all remember, right, adolescence is a really difficult time for kids, but if you give them things that, inshallah, can offset that, it really helps. And But it also creates a nice bond because it came from you. You saw a talent. If they like to draw, put them in arts classes. If they like chess, give them, you know, play with them. Let them get so good that they beat all the adults in the family. It's good. It's good for their confidence. But because you did that, you see, what you're doing is you're, you're, you're tightening your bond with your children. So this is innovative parenting. It's thinking, I need to, you know, look at where my kids are, the different unique talents that each has, and I'm going to nurture each one in their own way as best as I can. But I want to do that. I don't want a teacher or someone else to take that, right? I mean, it's, it's okay if, uh, if those opportunities are there, but it's much more special if, the, if it's coming from you as the parent. But you have to think of these things. Um, and then the teenagers, 14 and beyond, the, the theme really should be to befriend. We have to befriend our children. Again, this is an, a time where, unfortunately, you know, in the early age, uh, stages or early uh, years, parents are the main influencers over their children. But there is a time where friends become the main influencer. So even, you know, like the, whoever your children's friends are, they can absolutely over, you know, ride you. You know, in your absence, this is where kids learn to be more deceptive and to lie and to start doing things behind their kid, parents' backs. Because maybe they were peer pressured or maybe, you know, they just listened to someone who gave them bad advice. How, how does that happen? It's especially, and, and it's actually worse if you have this authoritative model where you have no personal um, or sort of friendly connection with your children. And it's sort of like top down. Like, I'm your parent. That's it. You just follow my rules. And I don't really, you know, want to engage with you on a more deeper, you know, uh, level. It's just... Follow the rules and that's it. If you have that type of parenting style, then for sure your kids are going to be under the influence of their friends more than you. But if you realize, like, you know, the teenagers, this is where I really, really need to be close with my friends, then you'll take, you know, the time to start doing things more, you know, with you and them. And, uh, you know, so, for example, you know, I suggest um, taking classes and doing experiences together. So you and your children, if there's a class or something that you think would be good for them, doing it with them, not just dropping off and going, I'll see you in a couple hours. No, going with them, accompanying them, sitting 
with them and learning the same thing. And then using that as an opportunity to discuss, to dialogue, to debate. It's really good to encourage um, your teenagers into discussion because what you're saying when you're open to have discuss discussions with your children, with your teenagers, is that I actually respect your point of view. I want to listen to your point of view, even if you think they don't know what they're talking about. And it's like internally you're just like, oh, here's those teenagers going on about things they don't know. It's okay. You know, let them get it out. Let them feel that they're validated, you know, when they're talking to you. Because sometimes, again, we talk at our teens like, yeah, 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 you know. But this is very unhealthy, and it's actually going to cause more division and more, you know, um, just distance. So the opposite of that is true, engaging them, having discussion. What do you think of this? What do you think of what's going on, you know, with, with the world or whatever it is, any news story that's going on? But letting them know, I respect you, okay, because this is one of their primary needs in this age, that you respect them. So these are, you know, the, the, the different things per age group. Um, and then we just kind of went over some statistics. So this is encouraging for parents who are really trying to raise and children who are rooted in their faith, okay? Because there is clear difference between children who have strong faith and homes that faith is important, whereas homes that are more secular and it's like, you know, it's not really a, a big thing, you know, a primary thing that's, uh, that's talked about or relevant into the in the family. So here, 54% of teens devoted to God say they are happy, while only 29% uh, are disengaged, okay? 47% uh, of religious teens think about the meaning of life. So alhamdulillah, if you plant these seeds early on, you get your, your teenagers actually to think about life seriously, to weigh the consequences of their decisions, you know, to have this sort of, you know, mindset will prevent and pr protect them, inshallah, from what the culture outside is telling them, right? Which is YOLO, FOMO, right? You only live once. Uh, these are the things that teens are getting bombarded with. Like just, you know, do whatever you want. You only live once. And that's honestly the, the most, one of the most destructive messages. But everybody, all the, you know, um, the, the, the people in media, the, the, you know, the icons that a lot of teens look up to, whether it's social media or musicians or artists or whatever, this is their way of life. You know, it's promoting this attitude to just live in the moment uh, feed your nafs, basically, do whatever you want. So you have to think, how can I offset that? Is giving your children a really strong foundation early about God and about their relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the numbers speak for themselves. When you do that, it does, inshallah, protect them, right? Um, they say here, 95% of devoted teens feel it is important to wait until marriage for sex. I mean, that's really big, and that's to our advantage. Because they're, you know, you're giving the, them those those things early on that by the time the topic becomes something that they're again, you know, uh, confronted with, that they alhamdulillah have, you know, their their conscience is clear and they know exactly that it's not something for them. Um, and then as far as the last statistic here, according to the Journal of Adolescence, findings demonstrate that religiosity measured as perceived importance of religion, attendance in worship services. And participation, oh, I'm sorry, you're not reading the same slide. Pardon me, here, the, here we go, the, the, the one in the yellow. Um, so uh, findings demonstrate that religiosity measured as perceived importance of religion, attendance and worship services, and participation in a religious youth group significantly contributed to explaining variation in six youth risk behaviors, smoking, alcohol use, truancy, sexual activity, marijuana use, and depression. So to bring them to the masjid, to attend those classes with them, to uh, constantly remind them, again, of the importance of religion and having a connection with Allah, um, it's going to protect your children, inshallah ta'ala, from a lot of the stuff that teens are, are that are plaguing teen culture. Okay? So it's, it's, a, it's good news for us, inshallah, as long as we do what we're doing. So now, this was a, a summary because I wanted you to follow the conversation uh, for mo those of you who weren't here for the last time, a summary of what we talked about the first session. Now, part two, the outline is a little different, um, and we're going to try to get to as much as possible, but let's go ahead, Bismillah, and uh, jump into here. So spiritual principles and practices for every Muslim home. Every Muslim home should really think about where they are when it comes to these issues here. Number one, to love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wholeheartedly and practice daily gratitude to him, OK? 
Okay. Now we obviously know, inshallah, we know the importance, the five daily prayers. This should be something set in stone in your home where, alhamdulillah, everybody prays their prayers. And you should, you know, encourage this as much as possible in congregation. So obviously during daily hours when kids are in school, you're at work, it's difficult. But in the evening, if you can make Maghrib and Isha together and even Fajr before they go to school, that means you've done three prayers as a family together and two of the prayers are not done together. This is still huge and you should make this part of your family culture where it's just this is what we do. We pray in Jama'ah. We, this is the importance of prayer and not like everybody for yourself. And, oh, you know, you just kind of walk in and i got to pray real quickly. And it's just disjointed and disconnected. It doesn't give your children the sense of how important prayer is if everything's rushed and nobody's really communicating about prayer, you know. Or if it's just like, yeah, did you pray? And you're just shouting from across, you know, the hall as reminders to each other about prayer. Why not? Plus, it's time for prayer, everybody together, right? It should be done as a family. And it keeps you in check and it keeps them in check. Um, love of recitation of the Qur'an. This is really important. You know, I used to teach Qur'an to little kids. And, uh, you know, I always remember that parents, some parents would come, you know, first couple of weeks or a few weeks into the school year. And they'd be very, very concerned about how many surahs their children was memorizing, you know, their child was memorizing. And as a Qur'an teacher, I would have to stop them and say, listen, this isn't a HIFS program, okay? If you want HIFS, put them in a HIFS program. We're teaching your child to love the Qur'an, okay? And so that is a process. It's not, you know, you, you know, like focusing on memorization alone isn't enough if you want your child to love the Qur'an. You have to, again, bring those stories to life. Make the Qur'an relevant to them. But in addition to that, teach teaching the recitation of the Qur'an like an art form instead of the subject is a really beautiful way to make it an enjoyable experience. So teaching them how to recite beautifully, teaching them to, um, you know, to, to find meanings or, uh, you know, certain meanings of surahs uh, that, that really speak to children's hearts, you know. There's so many things that you can do, but it all takes, again, your, you know, some, some creativity on your part. But I would have to tell parents, and I remember having to actually do, like, assembly, sort of, to just address this issue. Like, listen, it's so important that we teach your children adab with the Qur'an, to really know what the Qur'an is. This is the greatest treasure we have, to know how to treat it, to know how to walk with it. I've seen kids, you know, in many spaces, you know, they're going maybe in Sunday school or wherever. They have no, they're just treating the Qur'an like it's another book. They just tuck it under their arm. And they're walking around with it, sometimes dangling it, astaghfirullah, by their side. This is unacceptable. We have to, as parents, teach them this is the greatest thing that we have, and you have to honor it. Hold it with two hands above your waist. Make sure you're in a state of wudu. Be very mindful and respectful when you're touching the Qur'an. And then when you recite it, you bring your awe. You know, this is the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You don't um, sit there distracted, looking at your phone while it's like, okay. you know, And it's like this is what, unfortunately, again, what so many kids are forced into because their parents aren't really watching over them or they're just outsourcing the subject to other people and they're not really aware of what's going on. But walk, you know, go into certain spaces and you'll see, you know, really tragic things. I remember one of my friends, Safarullah, she was in a, in a masjid um, and she was working in an, a room adjacent to where the Qur'an teacher was teaching, you know, the students. And she was just listening to um, the banter that was going on between, be, before the, um, I mean, during the, the class. And when the Qur'an teacher was present, the kids were just like frozen, you know, model. And they were listening because they were afraid, right? She said one time in particular, she said, oh, they left, the Qur'an teacher left, stepped out for a moment. And as soon as he walked out, the kids started saying the worst thing, like, I hate this, you know, in Safra, they used a curse word, class, why do my parents bring me here? And they're all, like, angry and bitter because, you know, their parents are just maybe, you know, it's after hours, after school hours, it's like a convenient drop-off for them, and they're just, you know, they think, like, oh, they're going to go learn Quran. If your child expresses to you a disinterest in learning the Book of Allah or is frustrated every time you tell them to go learn then you're not going about it correctly. There's a problem. 
there's a disconnect. They're not, if they're like, ugh, you know, and that's their attitude to the book of Allah, but you still force them to do it, what are you doing? You're creating a total negative association. I had a, a student once tell me that her friend, astaghfirullah, I mean, this is what goes on in our community, but her friend began to cut herself uh, because she'd been traumatized her whole life. And one of the main reasons was because her mother was so hard on her when it came to Qur'an that even as a young three, four-year-old, if she would make a single mistake, she would chase her around the house, beating her, hitting her. So if you hit your children, astaghfirullah, yell at them um, and force them to learn the book of Allah and then, you know, guilt them the entire time, you're making terrible mistakes, terrible mistakes, because you're literally giving shaitan ammunition to make them, astaghfirullah, hate the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So if you're, please be mindful of who you, how you teach your children Qur'an and who you allow to teach your children Qur'an. Make sure that they're gentle and that they're loving and that they do it with beauty because it's the book of the most merciful of the merciful. You can't remove mercy when you teach the book of Allah and compassion. So be very careful with that. But a big part of how you beautify the Quran is to again approach it not as just this subject that has, you know, it's all a numbers game, but rather, you know, make it a beautiful experience. Recite with them, teach them to recite and go easy on them. You know, it's unless you're trying to produce the next, you know, Mishadi Ali Fasi, don't look at just numbers because the these verses will will well, they'll be responsible for them. Whatever they've memorized that they're not acting upon later in life, you know, they're going to be held accountable for it. So you have to be very careful with just trying to, you know, get to like, oh, I, I just want them to finish so then I can have like this big party for them and, you know, hold them up as a trophy into, in front of the community. Your priorities aren't right. It's very important that they love the, the book of Allah. So make sure that when you're teaching them, Quran that it's done in a really beautiful setting and our teachers advised having some treats out for them their favorite treats always making really positive associations you can do dates if they like dates you can do cookies you can give them candy but like having that out as part of the experience right we're learning Quran and you know inshallah this is what we will have to look forward to bringing stories to life these are all tips okay so and then dhikr you know I, I'm, uh, I've talked about this a lot but it's very important that we do the protective du'as every single day, okay? So um, how many people here do awrad every day? Like you do a, a, a wird as a family. Okay. Alhamdulillah, good. So the awrad, there's different ones, but our teachers here, all of our teachers here, they all recommend that we do the wird al-latif, which is the wird of Imam al-Haddad. You can do a search for it. There's PDF files. It's all available to you for free, and there's YouTube videos. It's an 18-minute recording. Every single day, this should be part of your household, like you know, experience. Well, in our household, for example, we do it at I mean, uh, excuse me, in the morning while I'm making breakfast for the kids. We have a Bluetooth speaker. We play it. It's resonating in the whole house. Everybody hears it, and it's just 18 minutes, but it's protective dawes. And I promise you, if you get into the habit of this, you will see the blessings in your own life, but also your children, even in the younger ones, they will memorize it without even knowing they're memorizing it. They might not speak Arabic. They might not have any idea. They might not even be reciting along with it. But if they're hearing it every single day, you will ask them, you know, in a few months' time to recite parts of it. They will know it. So this is beautiful for them and for you because it's like they can be coloring, they can be playing with their Legos, they can be eating breakfast, but it's just, inshallah, reminders, and it covers everything you can think about in terms of, you know, all the potential problems of your day, and it's asking Allah to protect your everything, you know, protect you from, from worry and depression, anxiety, protect you from debt, protect you from physical harm, protect you from every evil in his creation, and you're just, it's all from the sunnah. But these are things that we should make as a practice in our home if we want to protect ourselves and our children from all the harms out there. We are empowered with these du'a. The Prophet ﷺ left them for us for that exact reason. 
they're protective du'as. So if you're worried about, oh my God, I'm worried about my children, but then you're not doing this, there's a there's a problem. There's a disconnect there. You you can't be with them all the time. You can't oversee their every movement, but by it's kind of like putting them in this protective force field around them before you send them off to school or wherever they go. Even if your kids are a little older and they work, alhamdulillah, put make this a part of your culture in your home, in your, your family uh, life, that you, you do daily awrad every day. And uh, to be honest, 20 minutes of your time is nothing. If you consider the peace of mind you have to know, alhamdulillah, I've called on Allah to protect my children very specifically with very specific God. And I, inshallah, I, I put my trust in him. Okay, so it's very important to do that. And then to be devoted to the Prophet Sallallahu and committed to following his sunnah. It's so important that we, again, model this behavior ourselves. So taking on the attributes and the characteristics of the Prophet ﷺ for ourselves and then teaching our children the importance of modeling that, being gentle, being soft-spoken, just all the things that you associate with the Prophet ﷺ, being compassionate, speaking kind words, being generous, right? All these things that we love about him and that brings us to tears when we read about him. We are supposed to model it. It's not just that we look up to him and we're in awe of him and that's it. The objective is that we're doing it. So we follow his sunnah in every which way as much as possible. And this is for the brothers and the sisters, right? Um, so you know, and this is a direct command from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in, in surah uh, uh, chapter 59 verse 7. He says, وَمَا أَتَاكُمُ الرَّسُولُ فَخُذُوهُ وَمَا نَهَاكُمْ عَنْهُ فَانْتَهُ وَاتَّقُوا اللَّهَ إِنَّ اللَّهَ شَدِيدُ الْعِقَابِ Which is, and Allah says, and whatsoever the Prophet ﷺ gives you, take it. And whatsoever he forbids you, abstain from it. And fear Allah. Verily, Allah is severe in punishment. So following the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ is exactly that. Following his way and abstaining from what he uh, prevented us from abstaining from. Um, and then daily salawat, right? Um, very important, again, for us to realize how, uh, how much we should be calling on uh, or, or, or bringing in the salawat into our homes, making sure that our children are reminded of, of how important he is in our life. He's a central figure in our life. We should be remembering him. We should be seeking uh, you know, uh, just that connection with him. But if we're not doing these things, and then we're constantly, you know, saying, again, you know, when we're bringing him into our life, and when we're trying to make him, um, you know, the central part of our, our family, we cannot do that if we don't realize that he, and everything he did from, you know, the moment he woke up until the moment he slept, he gave us something to model. It's recorded for us. There's no other tradition you'll find that has as much detail of how the Prophet Sallallahu lived. But if we're not doing these things, and then we're saying, oh, he's important, it doesn't make sense, right? How convincing is that? If you're not doing anything, or you're very minimally following his sunnah, when you wake up, you don't say the du'as that you're supposed to say. When you go change your clothing, there's du'a for everything, going to the restroom, leaving that restroom, eating food, finishing your food, leaving the home. If we're not putting these sunnahs in place, but then we're trying so hard to convince our children how important he is. How convincing is it, right? You're not, you can't sell something that you yourself don't even believe. So it's so important that if you want him to be followed and respected and loved, that you first emulate that in your own practice. And so make sure that you're, you know, doing the things that are necessary for your children to say, okay, you know, that they they can follow you. But you have to create that. So that's where salawat is very important, making sure that. Your children, um, you know, are are doing that, but you are doing it as well. And there's actually a really, um, I can read a few of them, but here's some of the benefits of just doing salawat on a daily basis. Um, first of all, you're responding responding to the order of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. Allah commands that we do salawat, right? Um, and then you're also uh, the angels. The angels do salawat on the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. There's ten blessings from Allah for the one who invokes one blessing on the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So there's immense reward in that. Uh, he who sends blessings upon, upon the Prophet ﷺ, Allah raises him by 10 degrees. So your rank will literally be raised just by making this a, a regular practice. 
Um, he's also written for him 10 good deeds, erased from his record 10 bad deeds. Uh, you receive intercession of the Prophet okay? um, It's a means to have your sins forgiven, to have your worldly needs met. Uh, it's a means to draw near to the Prophet on the day of resurrection. And it, it, it compensates for giving charity for those who are too poor to give it. So if you're not in a means to financially give much, just do salawat and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give you that same reward, subhanAllah. It's a, mean, it's a means of fulfilling one's needs. It's a means to receive the Prophet's blessings, right? Especially on the day of Jummah. Every time we recite salawat on the day of Jummah specifically, he by his own tongue will respond salawat back onto us individually by name. So just imagining that the Prophet will say your name and say your children's name, right? I mean, that should just blow our mind. But we, if we're not doing it together as a family, then again, we're not creating that, you know, that that love for him. And it's all on us. Our, it's our duty as parents to be doing these things and teaching our children to do them as well. Um, it's a means of salvation from the horrors of the day of resurrection. It's a means uh, for the Prophet Sallallahu to return blessings. So we just said that. Um, it's a means to remember something which has been forgotten. So if you've ever tried to remember something and you can't, this is the practice. Just do salawat on the Prophet If uh, Or if you've lost something, there's people who, if you lose something, they'll tell you, just do salawat on Nabi, and you'll find it. I found in my own personal life, and this is like, it's amazing how often this happens for me. If I'm ever in a parking lot and I need a space, especially like, during like the Christmas shopping season, was like almost impossible uh, to find a parking spot or in a place where it's really difficult. Subhanallah! And as soon as I begin salawat, every single time without fail, not only do I get a space that opens up, but it's usually amazing. It's like in the first row. So do it. I, it's amazing. You just see Allah just opens doors for you. And I've done this so many times where I know it's completely an opening from from just doing the salawat. But these are things that you know if you put it into practice, you realize that there's immense benefits that you'll feel in your children as well. They'll feel that. They'll experience that in their hearts and, 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 and everything. It's just you're opening so much better to your, um, to your, to your home. Um, there's so many, mashallah, in this list. It refines the worshiper, worshiper's character and manners. So you'll just benefit by becoming better. <laughs> you know, you're, you'll emanate more nur. You'll actually start emulating, you know, other qualities of his. Because if you're taking on the practice of doing salawat on Prophet and your connection with him is stronger, then inshallah, naturally, you, you know, you're going to start following more and more of his sunnah and taking on more and more of his qualities. So it's like just all the way around an incredible benefit for you. But I, do, I would really recommend, and I've written about this too, about, you know, giving children their own tasbih, making it a special, you know, sort of... Um, Thing for them where they actually get to go and select their own they get to pick the beads and this becomes something that they can have that's their own but that you you know give them encourage them through incentives to do their salawat you know that inshallah you should you know make this a regular practice and then also friday especially should be a really special day it's you know the Prophet said it's the eid for the believer so really making it a fun day my kids for example i don't give them devices regularly we have a no device rule during the week, but on Fridays, select games that they really like. I will allow them for because it's Friday, and I want them to make those positive associations. And I tell them this is because of Juma. They'll get lollipops on Friday. They'll get you know ice cream, certain treats that they really like. But I always remind them it's because it's Friday that you're getting these things. This is the blessing of the day of the Prophet so I said it. It's the day he was born, and so we always try to, you know, uh, excuse, he, uh, excuse me, he was born on Monday, but we always remind him this is the day of, you know, salawat for the Prophet. So to remind him, to remind them that this is why it's such a special day, that's why you're getting these things, is really good because you're making, again, positive associations with him and with, with, uh, with the day of Jamal. And then to understand that these are principles that we should all definitely teach our children and understand them first and foremost ourselves. The concepts of ihsan and itqan. Ihsan, which is to do things with spiritual excellence, okay? And itqan is to do it meticulously but also thoroughly. So whatever, you know, we, when we do something, first of all, again, it goes back to us. We have to model this if we're going to be effective at, at teaching our children. 
But there are concepts that if you start applying it in your home and everybody falls in line, it's just a benefit all the way around. So you know what? Let's just start doing things really well. So if we're going to do something, if we're going to cook a meal, we have really good ingredients and everybody's, you know, all hands on deck. We're all doing it as a family. We just, we're, we're always mindful. We're present in the moment. And we're not, you know, t short, you know, taking shortcuts here and there. But just making this a, just a part of how you conduct your, yourself in every which way. If you, um, you know, clean something, if you, like a chore, if, if your parents or if you yourself are, are you know, delegated to, to, to do a certain task, that you do it so well that it's impressive. And then that, you know, is something that they'll model. So it's like, oh, if you're cleaning the bathroom, you know, do it really well. Show them this is how I want it to be done. Make sure that everything is clean. It's not just like this, you know, quickly wipe down and, you know, I'm out the door going back to my games sort of experience that a lot of kids, unfortunately, do, right? And then the parents walk in, and of course, we're never really happy, but we're like, oh, we'll just take it. No, you should bring them back and say, well, do you really think this was done with Ihsan? I can still see a big mess here. You didn't even touch this. You didn't do that, right? But remind them that they didn't really do a good job and make their standard better. And then, you know, the same for yourself. Have the same standard. But teaching them these concepts early will, inshallah, you know, benefit them in many ways, spiritually, but also in their work, in their school, because you're not, you're teaching them not to just, you know, um, be sort of like live in this sort of a blase sort of mindset because that's where our culture, every, nobody's doing things sincerely or really with wholeheartedness anymore. It's just like limited effort possible because we're all spread thin, everybody's tired, exhausted, right? But it really does affect your spiritual state if that's just who you are and that's how you live, where it's like you're not really putting your, you know, your full effort into something. So try to teach that early on. And then tafakkur and tadabbur, this is to reflect and to think, right? To contemplate the consequences of things. So for young children, you know, just teaching them to think about things and when they make mistakes, if we're just focusing on the punishment and not really teaching them how to, you know, realize what, like, to dig deep, realize the source of why they did what they did, but also to weigh consequences before they act. So preventative measures, right? When you teach them to, to do this, then they'll weigh the consequences of every act seriously. And they'll think about maybe twice about doing something they shouldn't do. Because you're teaching them that this is something we should do as Muslims. We should reflect on things and we should reflect on the consequences of things. So obviously as they get older, when certain topics come up, this is easier to do because you can kind of, as a family, have a discussion about certain things. Um, but it's just important to, this ter these terms, for them to know what they are, and then to, for you to put them into practice. Uh, muraqaba, which is to meditate, okay, to watch over one's uh, spiritual heart. This is also another very important thing that they should be learn learning even at a young age, to really just you know think about their connection, you know, with Allah. To think about these things, to think about the, to know the diseases of the heart, for example, right? Um, how many people here have the book, the purification of the heart, by Sheikh Hamza? This is a wonderful book that every family should have. And you should actually go through and look at the diseases of the heart and talk about them and say, you know, like how, you know, anger. Anger is a big thing that a lot of kids struggle with. But really looking at that as a disease and talking about that, how that affects, you know, your spiritual heart and what, you know, what the remedies are from the sunnah of the Prophet, how should we deal with anger? But like, you know, giving, getting, giving them topics like this to really reflect on and identifying that as this is a process in our faith. We do this. You know, we should do this. We should do muraqab. We should think about these things. And then muhasaba, which is self-inventory. Very important to teach your young kids to look at their day every single day and, um, and figure out, you know, where they, um, what their high points were, what their low points were, where they, you know, need to improve. But making this like a daily sort of practice. And you can either do that as a, you know, as a family where you kind of talk about things maybe over dinner, like have like a, you know, a sort of line of questioning, like who wants to share, you know, maybe their high point of the day. And is there anything that, that you're not proud of that you did today? But these could be very important family discussions, right? But it allows them to, again, learn this skill set that I need to take myself into account every day and to really think about my, the, you know, what I've done and, uh, and make this a spiritual practice that they continue well into their 
teen years and, and adult years, inshallah. Um, and then teaching them also uh, because you know kids need to know the balance of how to be to be generous, okay, with their time, with just who they are, without you know um, w you know without affecting their their spiritual heart. So giving being generous is very important in our tradition. And we should know that. Um, and, and you know you can teach them all of the hadith and the ayahs that are related to generosity. But to be also mindful and wise about how much they give of themselves, of their time, of their money. You know, sometimes kids get taken advantage of, um, you know, because their, their, their hearts are so pure. So just teaching them to give with prudence, to not give everything uh, right away, you know, that, that's important. And also another very important concept that they need to learn early on is to mind their own business. Okay, this is a principle in our faith, you know, that we, you don't, Nosiness and getting involved in things that are not for you to get involved in is not part of our tradition. And unfortunately, a lot of kids get pulled into very dangerous things because, you know, they're they're either nosy or someone's pushing them into doing something. You know, uh, friends especially. You know, they're getting involved into maybe another person's drama, right? A lot of kids are peer pressured into getting involved in, in things that are not there, like that have nothing to do with them. Because maybe, you know, again, it's, it's something that's happening in their peer group with their friends. But just teach them that as a principle, we don't get involved in things that have nothing to do with us. And you shouldn't either. Okay? If you see something that's happening in school, it's a fight, if people are fighting, it's not for you to go and see what's going on and, like, dig. Or if, you know, some, something's happened with a friend, for you to start calling up and what's going on, what's going on with her. Just mind your own business and live like that. You know, it protects you, and it's just part of, again, our tradition. And this is, again, based on the hadith, um, which is indeed among the excellence of a person's Islam, is that he leaves that which does not concern him. So it's really a matter of, you know, um, for us, too, as adults. I mean, if we're nosy and we're, you know, on social media, I mean, that's another big part of it, right? Like, within our friends and peer groups, one thing, but also if you're just looking into everybody's business and constantly wanting to know things, and that's how you're living, then your kids are going to follow. You know, if you're talking about other people and what they're doing, did you hear about so-and-so, did you hear about so-and-so, it's like you're modeling the worst qualities for them. So just mind your own business and teach them that you shouldn't be, you know, worried about what other people are doing. Focus on yourself. Um, and if they have, like I said, social media accounts, really monitor what they're doing, why they're watching certain things, why they're following certain people, what's their main objective, but controlling that because it's a very serious issue. Okay, so now um, in the time that we have, inshallah, let me see here. So I wanted to talk about here, um, it's hard for you guys to see this, so I'm just going to go to the next slide. The power of five, okay, so there's a couple of things that, um, are relevant to what we're talking about here. Experts say that maintaining this magic ratio of five to one uh, it's of positive to negative comments is really healthy model for all relationships. So going back to your parenting style, if your negative you know, comments, and whether it's with your spouse or with your children, if you're more negative, then you have to take yourself into account. Is, is it... You know, how off are you from this ratio? If it's more negative than positive, you're on a very destructive path. For your marriage, it's not going to go well. And this is based on um, uh, Dr. John Gottman. He's a leading psychologist, psychological researcher and relationship expert. He basically studied 700 married couples. And, um, you know, they, he, he watched, they were given prompts, and then they were allowed to discuss uh, things for about 15 minutes and then they went back and they watched the tape of their interactions and he was able to with 94 percent accuracy determine which couples were going to last and which ones were going to divorce just based on watching them for those 15 minutes because they picked up on how many negative exchanges they had versus how many positive so you in your marriage with your marriage and with your children you have to see where am i in this ratio do i you know, am I a very hypercritical parent or hypercritical spouse where all I'm doing is nitpicking and nagging and finding things to criticize? 
Or am I fair and balanced? Do I praise just as much as I criticize? But try to, this is the, the magic ratio, they say. If you can stay within this, where you have five positive, and then maybe you can be, you know, because we're, we're, you also don't want to, you know, completely um, gloss over clear issues. You have to call things out if you see them and their problems. Being critical is important, but also, you know, being tactful, not being harsh, but still being uh, constructive criticism is important. But keeping this ratio, five to one, it's, uh, it's just something to remember. And then the five love languages is also very important. How many of you have heard of this, the five love languages? Okay, so this is another really important, you can do a, a, a search, and, or there's books, you know, John, Dr. John Gray, um, he, I think that's the author, he, he wrote uh, this book that talks about basically every single person has different ways that they um, communicate love and that they receive love. So not only do we communicate it or we give love differently, but we also receive love differently. And you have to know your own love language and uh, your partner's love language, but also your children's love language because children are different. So when we talk about tailored parenting, this is part of it, to really recognize that not all children receive love the same way. So the first uh, love language is called words of affirmation. So if you're the type of person that really responds to words, like praises, compliments, if someone writes you a card or a letter or sends you a nice text message or email, or it's just sending you a really love, loving message, and that really means a lot to you, that's one of your love languages. It means that you need a lot of feedback. You need positive feedback. So if you, for the sisters, like for example, if you cook a meal, okay, and I'm, this is my, one of my love languages, and I've set it out and my husband doesn't say anything, <laughs> it instantly bothers me, right? Because I expect, I'm waiting for it. I'm waiting for him to go, oh, this is so delicious, right? So he knows that, and he knows that I'm, ex I'm waiting for it. You better say something. So alhamdulillah, we're very clear on our communication, but this is for me. I told him, I said, words matter to me. So I, I'm expecting certain things, um, you know, communicated. You can't just eat and then expect me to know that you liked it, right? Tell me that you liked it. Tell me what you liked about it. And I'll know if he didn't like it because he either says very little or nothing at all. So, uh, but this is one of uh, my love languages. Another um, love language is acts of service. So if you really appreciate when your partner helps you with certain things, whether it's chores around the house or just you know, different responsibilities and things where they're willing to always take care of certain things for you, and that matters a lot to you, then you can empower your partner and your children. Like, listen, I might not need compliments, and don't, like, flower me with all that stuff. I need you to take care of stuff. So if I give you a responsibility to do it because that, I you know, removes stress from my life, then now they know that this is the way that I can actually show, um, you know, show you love. Gifts, if gifts really matter, and you're the type that, mashallah, when you give a gift, you go all out and you're very thoughtful, you shop at specific stores, you package things beautifully, and there are people who are like that, they really are amazing at gift giving, then this is likely your love language too, and you really appreciate when someone goes all out and gives you like an amazing personalized gift, or just something that tells you that they were thinking of you. It might not even have to be anything expensive or anything like that, but just the fact that they went through that trouble, right, to go and get you something and thought of you in, when, in your absence, that means a lot to you, then that's your love language. Quality time, if none of those things really matter, you're not looking for compliments, you can do things on your own, gifts really, you don't have that much value for material things, but you really want to spend a lot of time together, um, and you want like physical you know, proximity, like you don't even have to be sitting next to me, but just be in the house. You know, I need to see you, I need to feel your presence in my life, don't be always leaving, then that's probably your love language. And then physical touch. So if you're affectionate and you really respond to that, that's your love language. But all of these are so important to identify in ourselves first, identify in our partners, and then in our children. So there's actual, you know, you can, Take, there's quizzes that can kind of help you determine what your love language is. I would definitely encourage you to do this with your children. And you'll see what it does, again, is it helps you to customize your, your you know, parenting with your children better. Because you'll know, like, some kids, they might want gifts more, whereas others want, you know, quality time. But it may, makes a big difference in your parenting style. So these are just, you know, the power of five, two little things that I thought were good takeaways for you to think about. When, uh, when, when considering your, again, parenting style. 
Okay, so any questions before we get to this? Because this is the, the topic that I've been waiting to get to, the temperaments. Any questions before we get here? Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. Mashallah. You know, doing the bare minimum, which is what that hadith was, right? Isn't the same as saying that I'm not, um, because we're, we're not talking about necessarily quantity, we're talking about quality. So if you're going to do the bare minimum, then you better be doing it really well. So if you're just going to do your fard prayers, let's say, and you're not going to do sunnah, then you better be doing them with absolute khushu if you're going to use that hadith, right? Because you can't just use that hadith to say, well, I'm just doing the minimum, because that's not the standard of the Prophet's lesson. The Prophet is making it easy for people to say that you don't have to do beyond that quantitatively, but the quality, you, there's no argument there, right? You have to have khushu, you have to make sure you're present and mindful of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So all those things. So that's where you, I would focus on, a, you know, because sometimes children, they can be very smart, right? And they think they've outsmarted you and they come with all these quick comebacks. But you have to also think like the mind of a child and say, I see what you're doing here. You're looking for a nice little shortcut out. But I'm going to remind you that the Prophet ﷺ didn't give that, you know, that, that hadith isn't related to us so that we can just use it to, you know, basically take the easiest route. It's actually made to simplify for people who have maybe challenges and difficulties. But the quality of standard is not compromised, right? And so remind them that you have to do whatever you do. If you're going to pray a certain amount or fast a certain amount, whatever it is, just make sure it is 100%. And that's ihsan, right? The quality is still there. That's a good question. <laughs> Alhamdulillah. Okay, so the four temperaments is um, a topic that... Uh, you know, it's highly encouraged to study when it comes to, again, in, individually for us to know ourselves really well, our spouses, but also our, our children. And so what is it? Um, so it or originated um, in ancient Egypt or Mesopotamia many, many, many thousands of years ago. And it's very, uh, it's, it's linked to the, or the science of the four elements, okay? And this is around 400 B.C., so the four elements are earth, air, water, and fire. Um, and this was um, the, you know, Hippocrates, the father of modern medicine. He basically came up with this theory based on, you know, his um, just looking at, at different human behavior and emotions. And he said that based on either an excess of or a lack of certain bodily fluids, people behave differently. Okay. And so he looked at blood yellow bile, black bile, and phlegm. And these are the four fluids that he was looking at different, again, people and saying if there was an excess or, or you know, there was a shortage of these humors, he called them, then people would behave differently. Now, centuries later, Galen, who's another Greek uh, physician, he came up with a typology of temperament based on the same science. And he said, he went to the next level and said, he classified um, human behavior as either hot, cold, dry, or wet. Again, this is related to the four elements. But then he gave them names. And he said, people, based on, again, their different levels of these fluids in their body, they behave differently. And their typographies are sanguine, choleric, melancholic, and phlegmatic. So basically, based on where you are, where your fluids are, you're going to behave a certain way, and it's going to fall in line into one of these four temperaments, they called them. Now, Ibn Sina, who we know uh, as Avi, or Avi Chen or Ibn Sina, he's a, you know, uh, he, he's the greatest or one of the greatest you know, physicians uh, in Islamic uh, history. He extended the theory of temperaments to encompass emotional aspects, mental capacity, moral attitudes, self-awareness, movements, and dreams. So they're all kind of expanding on this science, right? And then later on, um, other phys Muslim physicians... Uh, and, um, in, in addition to Ibn Sina, are Abu Bakr Muhammad Zakari al Razi, Ibn Qayyim al Jawziyah, and then Jalaluddin al Suyuti. They all 
also commented on this science and used this science of the four temperaments. Okay, so this is a very a big part of our history. So what are they? Here are the four uh, temperaments again: the choleric, the sanguine, phlegmatic, and melancholic. So every person, according to the science, falls into predominantly one of these temperaments. So all of us here. As we read the descriptions, you're going to find, okay, that actually sounds like me. Um, and you'll once you get more well-versed in this science, then you can study it for your children, too. It's very important to know your children's temperaments. So the first one is called the choleric. Okay? So what, who are the choleric? So you know the names are, are kind of difficult sometimes for people to remember. So just remember the animal that's associated with it. Okay? The choleric's animal is a lion. Okay? And they are extroverts, okay? So if you're an extroverted person, you might be a color. Um, they're reactionary, so very quick to react to things, fiery sort of energy. They're rational and not very emotionally expressive. So if you're not someone that's, you know, easily, or you just don't, you know, express yourself very well emotionally, you might be a, a choleric. Natural born leaders, so very strong, willed people. That's where that red fire energy, so just, you see that, again, the lion have all that uh, imagery there. They're assertive and in charge. They tend to dominate whatever they do. So if you're ever working in a group setting, you will know the choleric very clearly. They're probably the ones talking over everybody. They like things done their way. They're argumentative. They're kind of just really just strong-willed and strong-headed people. And their motto is, we like to have it our way. So that's one of the, you know, controlling sort of personality type. So if you identify with this, you are likely a choleric. And this is, again, for brothers and sisters. Um, the next is a sanguine. Okay, this is represented, represented by the animal, the golden retriever. Okay, so um, extroverts as well. So friendly super um, just they're reactionary but they're very they're emotionally expressive uh, they love people in large groups so they kind of tend to be like the life of the party they just they're bubbly okay that's where that yellow color just it's just happy they're, they seem to be a little too happy <laughs> maybe too chipper all the time uh, they're talkative and excitable okay uh, they're optimistic uh, they love to laugh and are usually, again, the life of the party. And their motto is, we like to be popular. So they're very well known. Okay, They're always maybe just social, just very social pe people. Okay, So if you're a sanguine, then just keep this in mind. Again, that golden retriever, happy sort of personality type. Okay? Then we have the phlegmatic. Okay, So now we're into the introverted signs. So they're introverted, and they're represented by the otter. Okay. They're non-reactionary. They're emotionally expressive. They love to analyze people. So they tend to just be a little bit more quiet, analytical. Okay? They're humble and calm. They have very calming nature. So they're not excitable. They don't, when they talk, they're not like loud and boisterous. They're just calm. They have, you know, they're versatile. That means they're flexible. They're kind of go with the flow. They're great listeners. So if you have uh, a phlegmatic in your life, they're the other ones you can turn to, and they're just very, very, just have that calming, healing presence. Um, and their motto is, we like it peaceful and calm. Okay. And then the last one is the melancholic. Okay, they're introverts as well. Um, they're non-reactionary. They're not emotionally expressive. So the melancholic is similar to the choleric in that way. Okay, they're, but they're, the difference is that one's reactionary, the other's not, right? Uh, they're serious and very analytical. So if you're a numbers kind of a person and you're just like, you know, you like to just stay focused and on task and you, you know, you're not, you're not like a dreamer always thinking about things, but you're just very focused on what's happening in front of you. You like things systematically done. You're like organization. You're likely a melancholic. Task-oriented and natural problem solvers. They're very disciplined and organized, and their motto is, we like it done the right way. Okay? So these four temperaments, again, are all of us fall predominantly into one. There are blends, 
but you should by now know where you are. How many people feel like they identify with at least one? Yeah? Okay, good. So once you know yourself really well, as I said, and there's a book, it's called The Temperament That God Gave You. Um, it's a non-Muslim author. I can't remember the author, but you can find it even in libraries if you don't want to buy it. Um, you can just check it out. But it's uh, a book that our teachers recommend reading because it does give you more context into the science, but also helps, uh, as I said, with children, with, with parenting, because you'll start to see your children's temperaments. You'll start to see if you have an extroverted child and an introverted child, you'll see that they, they're different for a reason. And the two primary things that really help to measure, uh, this is, you know, pretty detailed, but like just a quick way to assess what uh, your what a person's temperament is, is how reactionary are they? Are they reactionary? And how long does that reaction last? Okay, so let's say you're, you know, if you have a conflict with someone or in a confrontational situation, the choleric, right, this person, they're going to fire right back. Okay, so it's like a hostile sort of exchange. They're not ones to back down from confrontation ever, and they will not forget. So if a choleric personality type is not afraid or intimidated by confrontation, and they'll likely cut you out, like you're just done. I have no time for you, and because they don't, they don't. It's not they're not very forgiving, so they'll hold that grudge for like years. Okay, the sanguine. They might react in the moment because you're catching them off guard, so they might, you know, have a response right away, but then guilt will, you know, overtake them. So maybe 10 minutes later they feel bad, and they'll come to you and go, I'm so sorry. Uh, can we forget about what happened, please? And a lot of times in marital situations, it's very common, right? One partner or the other will do something like hit below the belt, say something really mean, but then they'll just feel so bad for it a few minutes later, and it kind of can throw people off. Like, what? You know, so it... it you know, it's, it's very common to have the, these, this dynamic. But the sanguine will want to fix it right away, even though they're reactionary. Now, the phlegmatic, they're the type that if they're in a confrontation, they almost freeze. They don't know how to deal with it in the moment because it's completely like they just shut down. So they won't say something right then and there. They'll just stand there listening, observing. And then three, four days later, you'll get that text message or phone call, okay, that says, you know, what you did was very offensive, or I'm very hurt by what you said. And so they're non-reactionary, okay, but they're forgiving. So they want to fix it because they're still emotionally, you know, invested in the care. So it's like they don't re react right away, but then they want to patch it up quickly. So they'll say, I still love you, I still, I forgive you. So they're quick to get over it, and they won't hold a grudge. The melancholic is the toughest one to crack because this person is not reactionary at all. So they will, if it's a confrontation, they'll just, again, remain quiet and you won't hear anything from them from, from them for maybe years. Okay, So like you won't even know half the time with a melancholic why they're upset at someone. They won't say anything until maybe years down the line and then they go, well, 10 years ago, you know, you said this to me, or you did this, you disrespected me, you know, and you're like, what? You've been holding on to that for that long? But they are very capable of holding on to things for a very long time. So they hold on to grudges, they're not very easily forgiving, and they're non-reactionary. So think about your children. Do you see, because you should see patterns already. You should see that child who is very unforgiving, if you have one of those, if something happens and they're just like brooding forever, I don't forgive you, I'm so mad at you, you know? And then you might have the other child who as soon as something happens, they're just like, it's okay, it's not a big deal. And they're like quick to forgive and move on. This, this is the, their temperament. It's revealing itself. But when you study it really in depth, it helps you to, again, know how to reach them better, right? You're not just doing a one-size-fits-all parenting. You're actually tailoring it to their personalities. Like this is, you know unique to you. You're unique in this way, therefore I have to, you know, parent differently for you. And honestly, this science is, um, you know, it's been used for, for decades by educators, by psychologists. Unfortunately now, you know, it's not as, as common anymore. Uh, but you see it, and even in the professional world, you know, there's companies that, that do personality typing and testing, right? What for? It's because 
they know that if you actually you know figure people out and kind of see patterns of behavior you're able to place them better in the company or give them assign work and tasks to them that's more suitable for their temperament for example like you know a melancholic person is great for you know like account accounting work or office work right because they're not very personable so they're not somebody that you would put at the front end of the office to meet and greet people or you know in a business because their personality types they're, they don't have that disposition they're serious analytical critical thinking people great for doing things like in the back office right and then a sanguine right though a sanguine would just wilt like a flower if you put them in an office or put them in in a job where they're not interacting with people they need to be in the front end they need to be out talking to people because a lot you know gave them that personality where they can just really engage well with people so if you know your children then you can see their strengths right and then help them to develop their strengths and also prevent them from doing things like I had I remember I did a talk once and then afterwards one of the moms came up to me she was totally devastated I, I did a similar presentation where I talked about the temperaments but she was just crying and I was you know I was trying to calm her down and she just felt horrible she said that she realized that her two uh, sons were very different. One was an extrovert and one was an introvert. But their whole life, basically, she measured her introverted son to her extroverted son. And he was never good enough. And she always felt like he was lag lacking or just lagging behind because her extroverted was outgoing. He was just very successful. He was athletic. He did all these things that were just, you know, just really shined, you know. And, and her, ex her introverted son was not that person. He was very timid, very quiet. If he went to a, a social gathering, he wanted to carry a book with him everywhere he went and he would just find a corner. But she always felt like she was, and she did in the, after the talk, she realized that had she known this before, she would have just seen their individuality. But unfortunately, she, she you know, really damaged, in her own words, her relationship with her second son because she made him feel always inferior. So, you know, it was a, a moment for her, but I, you know, th this is why it's so important to study these things early, because you won't do that, inshallah. You'll actually start to see your children for who they are, and you'll start to tailor, again, your parenting to them. But if you don't have this in your tool belt, and you're just going to treat them all the same, then you're, you're not going to make those connections, which we talked about in the beginning. That reach, you're not going to have very much reach with your children. So this is what, why it's so important to, to really you know, learn your children's personality types, be attentive to their differences, and honor them and validate them. Because just like you're unique, I'm unique, we're all unique, so are your children. And even though we have ideals about how we want them to be, if we see them exclusively as extensions of ourselves, it's a total injustice. Because they're not. They're not extensions of us. We, you know, they're our children, but they're individuals. And they might have sparks of us here and there but you have to let them grow into their own person still guide them still you know show them the right way but don't judge them so critically and harshly that just because they do things differently than you do or that you think is you know is good or ideal that you start looking down on them and then treating them harshly and using words like oh you're you're a loser and you know parents stuff well they can really damage their children they're not aware of the harsh words that they say when they're critical but it can be very, you know, life, these are lifelong, you know, issues that, that are, um, that happen when you, when you talk to your children that way. They'll deal with that for their whole life. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Because as we talked about the emotional expression, right, that's going to be a big, you know, uh, sort of indicator of what a person's love language is because emotionally expressive people do like like the sanguine is absolutely gonna love words of praise and affirmation right because that's their their expressive right and phlegmatics as well phlegmatics love to connect they love they're, they're very emotional people they're just not as reactionary as the sanguine but they're similar so these two signs are similar just as the melancholic and choleric are similar they're not as uh, emotionally expressive but they might respond a lot to acts of service for example right or quality time because even though i don't need you to you know shower me with words 
I still appreciate you around me, right? So yes, there's definitely a correlation there. And again, when you're learning these things together, you're going to start seeing patterns for yourself, your spouse, your children, everybody in your life. You're going to start to suddenly see them through their lens instead of seeing them through your own subjective lens, which is usually not accurate, right? We don't always read people accurately. Uh, but we're, you know, unfortunately, because we only have our own selves to rely on, we think we've got it down. There's a lot of overconfident people who think they know people really well, but if they really don't know them. They're just applying, projecting their own views onto them. But when you do things this way, you really are knowing people. Because it's like, I've studied you. I've, we've looked at this. We've looked at your love language. We've looked at your temperament. We now have, you know, something to help identify the nuances of your personality, and therefore, you know, we're becoming more fluent in reading each other. And if the whole family's doing it, the siblings know each other. It's like my children, they know their temperaments. We've talked about love languages, and it comes up. You know, they, they use it even for themselves. Like, oh, you know, if they're, you know, if they're uh, having, you know, uh, like an outburst, they'll be like, oh, so Mr. Choleric, you know, is coming out now, you know. But it's a good thing for them to use because they, it, it prevents them from labeling and harming each other with language, you know, which is children can do that. Siblings do that with each other all the time. They start fighting. There's no understanding, right? It's just like, oh, you, they just, they're angry because they don't understand their sibling's behavior or words or whatever. So then they just start taking everything personally. But if you actually frame it this way and empower them to know that you're different than them, they operate differently than you, be respectful of how you engage with them and you know, take these things into consideration, then everybody's validated, right? It just creates um, more empathy, which is what we want. We want to be more em empathetic. We, w we should want our children to be more empathetic. These, these are all prophetic qualities. The Prophet was very, like he, when he would, was with people, he really took time and, and made them feel like they were completely seen and visible and heard. He really paid attention to, to people. We're, again, because of our distracted worlds and natures, we, we're all just sort of, you know, robotically moving through our worlds and our families and our home life is like that. But this requires you to actually be more present. So that's why it's very important that we study these sciences. Yes? Yes. Absolutely. 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 And the objective here, yes, is to identify where you are, but to not just look at yourself like a, you know, this is who I am and that's it. You're a work in progress. And they say that actually uh, in the, when you're studying the four temperaments, I, I'm not sure who came up with this, but that all of the four khulafa are represented by one of each four. So you can see, and then they said that the Prophet he had perfect balance, right? So he's a perfect balance of everything. And our objective is to look at his model, and you'll see that everything, all the negative qualities that go into each one are resolved when you get to the Prophet because you don't see that there, right? He's, he's just he, he's the perfect representation of how we should be. But when you, um, yes, you, if you look at yourself again as a work in progress, then you'll realize that my task, my spiritual task is to, you know, to, uh, to tend to all these things, whatever my negative qualities are or the things that I need to align with his way, I have to work on that. So if I have a problem being more, you know, if I'm not as affectionate, if I'm a melancholic or a choleric and I have an issue being affectionate with my children or my loved ones, this is not from, you know, this is not the prophetic way, right? There's hadith where he talks about that, about, you know, being more affectionate with your loved ones. So how am I going to work on that? I have to dig deep, be more vulnerable, kind of find the words if it's hard for me, work on that, right? But looking at yourself constantly as a work in progress and trying to br uh, bring more balance. Okay. Yes? Right. Absolutely. Yes, you're br bringing balance. Because the sanguine, what do you think, let's just talk about, for example, spiritual diseases. What do you think might be a spiritual disease that a sanguine personality would, would fall into from the, from the diseases of the heart? 
Showing off, exactly. If I, if, if, if you're a sanguine and Allah's giving you this ability to just be like super friendly and talkative and you can go, and you're outgoing and you can go out there and do anything, this is potentially going to be something that you have to work on, right? Or a risk for you. That you're probably going to, you know, because popularity is now is what motivates you, that you're starting to do things just to be seen, just to be recognized, to be praised. So this is a disease of the heart potentially for you. So this is where, yes, you have to bring balance. If you're always in the front, if you're always in the center of attention, maybe you're leaning too much on that. And even now with social media, you know, this is unfortunately a big thing that social media promotes, to be seen, to be seen, to be seen. So even people who aren't necessarily sanguine are, you know, are afflicted with, these, with this disease. And so it's definitely something to consider. But each one of them, like choleric, they're, they're one of their primary diseases that they have to work on is anger because they're very reactionary and fiery. And so if you're a choleric personality, you have to be true with yourself and say, yeah, I have to rein that in. I'm too intense and I can intimidate people. I'm, maybe I am scary. Maybe I need to be real with myself and just say, you know what? It's not uh, that I'm a terrible person. Because the, the reason why I love the science is it does really validate the fact that there is design in human personality and temperament. And we're all just designed differently and uniquely. But it's not that it's a blemish, you know. Because sometimes we, we, we break other people down or we break ourselves down and just attribute all these negative qualities and take it on like we're horrible human beings. And especially when you're comparing it to the Prophet I said, then you just feel like the worst, right? But if you actually sit there and say, SubhanAllah, it's just design. And that's why I love that, you know, um, the, the four khulafa are represented in each of these because you can see that. Like Omar, we know, he's, he was very jalali, right? And he was very intimidating. But he was also incredibly soft. And he, through his journey, literally, he, he transformed. So there's hope to say that no matter where you are, there's hope for positive transformation. If you, like the brother was saying, see yourself as you know, a work in progress, like wherever your negative qualities are. But when you empower your children with the science, again, it validates them. You're not attributing them all these horrible qualities and just labeling them and like making them feel like they're they're nothing. You're saying, this is just your personality type and these are the areas that, you know, you need to work on and these are your strengths. So mashallah, you know, Allah has given you this great ability and it's just, it's a very, it's a much more positive way to help under, bring more understanding. Inshallah. Yes. Right away. I mean, you can see him very early on. Oh yeah, that's why that book, the temperament that God gave you, it's really uh, like for parents and you know, educators to look at for children. So you'll see, like, yeah, you can see the signs very early on. And people, like I said, will they can change? Yeah. So it's not like it's you know set, because as you grow and you know environmentally things happen, you you're, you might shift or you might start taking on sort of a blend between two different, and so there is a primary and a secondary. So when you take the tests and they're online, and even in the book, you can, uh, it'll determine for you what your primary is and what your secondary is, and you'll see like a crossover. So but yeah, it's a very, very helpful tool. I'm sorry? Oh yeah, sorry, yes. So this is phlegmatic. You know, Allah, maybe because the four temperaments is initially based on, right, the fluids. So if, you know, if we're really true to the science, then there is a physiological sort of aspect there, right? And that's what the science is, is that all of these different fluids, you know, it, it's, it explains the variation of human behavior. So, yeah. I'm sorry, the other ones too? Yes, England? The, I know the text is very small. But I can, if you uh, if you like to give me your email, I can always send you like the the more clear descriptions. Okay, inshallah. But any other questions about this? Yes. Sure. Right. Every single personality test out there is based on the four elements, and that's why they're all very like multiples of four. You'll have sixteen personalities. So they're all based on this ancient science. And that's why, you know, when you, you look at it, it's, it's so fascinating. I mean, this has been around for millennia, subhanAllah. Right? Alhamdulillah. All right, Jazakallah khair. If there's no other questions, inshallah, I think we're right on time. So we can end, inshallah, in dua.
Yeah. She's like, oh, so we'll finish her job. Inshallah, the next one will be in a month. Uh, yeah, we'll announce the date. I don't. I, I think the date is set on the website, but I'm not sure. Do you know the date? Okay. Inshallah. Okay. Alhamdulillah. Jazakallah khairan. All right. So we'll end. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdika shadu an la ilaha illa anta na astaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk. Allahumma salli wa sallam wa barik ala sayyidina wa maulana Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam taslimin kathiran. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Wal asr inna l-insanu lafi khusr illa al-ladhina amanu wa amanu salihati wa tawasu bil haqqi wa tawasu bil sahbihi. Jazakumullah khairan. Thank you so much for coming. Inshallah we'll see you next time. And if you have any questions, I don't have it written, but I can provide my email address to anybody. And offline we can exchange more information. Thank you.